We think it's high time to redefine and reclaim the African American musical culture. We think songs that are violent and confrontational entraps the African American community into a negative association that has been prevailing within status quo. Before we move on to the issue, what are the caveats of this debate? Number one, what is the debate not about? We think this debate is not about banning of all these songs that are violent and confrontational. These songs can still exist. We just think that we prefer songs that are peaceful and non-confrontational in its approach, right? We think number two, we are not banning artists from making these songs as well, but we think that they should change in a manner in which they approach this man, uh, 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 association in, in terms of violence and what happens within the African American community. <coughs> But what is the debate about? We think that we need to assume that there is a predominant violent uh, association with these songs that are very confrontational, right? Songs by like <coughs> NWA about like, F the police and, and songs about by PDD or BFG about Nation of Islam. We think that we need to assume that predominance of violence within that song and we need to change the association in which it happens. What are the contexts? Right? Let's, let's start with uh, what are our sorry? What are our stands for opening government? We think number one, we need we need to redefine and reconstruct an African American musical culture that is very harmful. Right? We think number one, we want to put them away from the uh, the entrenchment of this negative association association. And number two, how does African American better their musical culture? Because we think that music is very accessible, in which the association is attached to this community is very negative. So what are the contexts? Right? We think that firstly, number one, the hip hop movement started out with in South South. Chicago and Bronx that was lead, led by people like Dr. Dre, uh, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, Tupac, and NWA, like Little Boys, right? Okay. We think that uh, the hip hop movement in, 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 I thought at that, that time was seeing about things like anti anti establishment, anti police rhetorics, and predominant informal economy, right? That's I'll talk about you later. So, what is, what is the things that they were singing about and what are the songs that they were singing about and the, the lifestyle that they were having, right? We think they were singing a, a lot about hating the establishment because they were entrapped within a uh, systematically disenfranchised and discriminated by the, by the, the predominantly white government. Number two, uh, there was a lot of anti-police rhetoric, right? Even until now, songs about police brutality like uh, NWA, uh, I think police. Um, number three, I think there was a lot of predominant informed economy that was also flourishing within those songs songs about drug trade, songs about violence, songs about gangs, and so uh, even like songs like, like by Ghetto Boys, right? Or it's, it, feels too, it feels really good to be a gangster, that was a song. So we think number three, it solidifies the confrontational identity. In the time when hip hop was formed, gangs were very rampant and there was a lot of killings in the south side of Chicago, right? There was a lot of gangs, uh, gang violence between the east side and the west side. There was, there was that caused the hip hop culture to flourish. So we think that in the foundation of in which this music culture started was already very negative. So what is the problem from side opening government? We create an association of African American musical culture to things that the to issues of to do that of violence and um and, and confrontational. And uh, cultural things are very important to, things to talk about, right? Because it manifests within that community. For example, like it, musical culture differs <coughs> different ethnic groups. For example, like how uh, within the 70s and 80s, there was a rise of white pop like the Beatles and, and Michael Jackson, and how the Hispanics were predominantly in jazz, and how Asian Americans or Asian in general were very involved in classical music, right? So all these things were not very harmful in which they attached their musical culture on to their ethnic groups. However, within the African American, because they were in systemic, systemic, systematic discrimination, they used these songs to then um, talk about these feelings, right? We're not banning these feelings and we're not talk, we don't, we're not banning artists from talking about these feelings, but we feel that because music is so accessible and the African American music culture is so predominant within status quo, therefore the effect is very, very large. So what is the conclusion that I uh, have, right? We think that it lets, if we're not saying that the African American music culture is the one that leads this system of discrimination, yeah. but it, it has a big, but in playing the in, in which entraps this African American community within this side, we think is uh, is so right. So like the elite African American is not going to be affected, but the underprivileged African Americans living in ghetto areas will be affected by this kind of culture in which people associate them to this. So because number three, the conclusion is we have we form white uh, fragility and white paranoia, right? Because white people also access this music and listen to this music. So you need to understand what people are the privileged and also position in position of power right. to give employment and jobs to these African Americans, right? Therefore, when when white people keep listening to music, it, it forms some form of paranoia that oh, you know, black people are criminals and black people are more 
prone to violence. Therefore, we think <coughs> the entrenchment is very bad. Closing. Closing? No? Opening? Okay, clarification. How would the Fuck the Police song change under your side? So give us a hint of how the lyrics would look like under your side. Oh, the lyrics would look like, oh, you know, we should we should talk about things with the police instead of like, you know, not fucking the police. <laughs> no, we think that we should work with the police. You have to understand, in those ghetto areas, there's, we need security and we need the police to be there and ensure the peace and safety of all other African Americans. So I think that song can talk about like, oh, you know, we should talk with the police instead of like, fucking Right. Yeah. So number two, we think that these artists can still raise awareness in these issues to talk about these issues. Like for example, Colin Kaepernick who retaliated by not you know standing up for national anthem. Right. I think that it wasn't violent and it wasn't very confrontational, but it still has some form of virality and in, in, in raising awareness. Right. Like how Beyonce also talked about you know you should join the Black Lives Movement itself. You know engaging in those form of violence. So we prefer that. We also prefer um, you know people like Drake and Frank Ocean over Tupac or PDD. PDD because if you see, if you listen to a lot of songs about Jane and Frank Ocean, it's always about love. It's always about you know creating some form of relationship with other people. It's never violent. It's never confrontational. Therefore, how, what what is our benefit, right? We think number one, the youth. That, so this is the characterization, right? Young, poor African American living in the ghetto, continuously listening to angry rap songs, would not create a negative youth culture, right? So this there's a form of cultural expectation that is placed on all these youth to act violent. To do, do drugs, so to not go to school and to uh, take up weapon, uh, weapons and, and be in gangs, right? So it's a cultural expectation in which it entraps you within that community. We think as a youth, you need to ex because they're impressionable, impressionable, we need to expose them to songs that are all peace and non confrontational so they won't engage in violence. Therefore, we increase a form of counter narrative. And this artist, knowing that these artists have a lot of capital within the inter entertainment industry, right? We think they are able to then push for all these counter narratives within society to all these youth that are very easy influenced by all this culture. We think number two, we also find a lot of the white paranoia in, that was increased with this. Uh, big predominant African American music culture. Closing opening government <coughs> tell you that we would redefine and deconstruct the negative association in which African American music culture has entrapped its own people with the association of violence and non confrontational. We think when black hip hop artists take a stand in peace and non confrontational songs, we will start to deconstruct and de uh, and send them more association of positive things. Go your opening government. <laughs> Hello, it is incredibly soft for OG to come up and say that these songs are incredibly bad but at the same time say that you don't want to ban them. Because if you say that it's bad, but not bad enough to ban them, clearly you're conceding that on balance there are some sort of benefits that exist in the status quo, and you would also prefer that these songs exist within the status quo. We think that there's an incredibly tension coming straight from the stance of opening government. But we agree, uh, wait, the, oh, the one analysis that she then told people is that, look, we need to break this predominant violent association in the status quo between African Americans and fight. But look, why do uh, white individuals right now in the status quo think African Americans are a threat? We think that it's incredibly varied the reasons for doing so. Two, right? A, historical beliefs that basically think that because they descend from slaves, slaves are inherently more violent. That's why we think that African Americans, for example, are more violent. Or two, arbitrary association of violence uh, to minorities by majority groups to justify their elitism and their belief that being born white is being born better. Or lastly, for example, the vast portrayals in TV shows, for example, of the like um the terrorists, for example, always being is uh, Islamic or the manga coming after them in New York uh, in the middle of New York City 
is always African Americans are all far better examples of why uh, why people perceive African Americans to be violent. They didn't provide any mechanistic analysis beyond saying that look, as long as it disappears, we think it's a good uh, it's within a good way. The stance of OO today is we think that on uh, like we think that on a, uh, we think on the balance we would prefer violent confrontation lyrics in more and more rap songs, right? We think Frank Sinatra can exist, but we would prefer songs to be about confrontation because look, what is fundamentally at the heart of the debate about race in America today? It's a simple question: Does racial discrimination in the modern world? even exist. Many white people don't see the harm in stop and freeze policies because in their eyes it is only meant to stop suspicious individuals from carrying guns. If you are not doing anything wrong, they say, the police will let you go. Literally Trump's words, for example, in the debate. Underlying this is the implicit trust amongst the white community that police treats members of all races equally. It is a trust that the black community does not share. How then do we solve this problem? We think songs are an excellent way to reach out to the white community about the realities of living while black in America. Why? Because these lyrics don't just advocate confrontation. They also paint the picture of why confrontation is even necessary. Look at Tupac, to cause change, right? Pure nigger, I mean, cops give a damn about a negro. Pure nigger, he a hero. We think, at all, that through the uniquely popular vehicle of hip hop, for example, you reach more people and you increase awareness for on it about uh, like what is precisely to live while black in America among the white community in the US. Because here's the difference, right? A violent confrontation, oh, um, here's the difference. Right, so look, and violent imagery, therefore, is also an expression of the pain of these communities. They resort to violence is never a first resort panel. It is done only when all other, all other options are, ex uh, are exhausted. It increases the visceral pain felt by the minority community and it is necessary through the use of violent imagery to construct this pain and transmit this pain to people who listen to this song. But that's one. But secondly, Hannah, we also think that these songs are about solidarity with the African Americans throughout the country. They are simple. They are the oftentimes the target audience of these particular songs, Hannah. Why? Because they are sympathetic to the outrage that drives this violent impulses. Only they know the absurd indignity that black people have to appear as non-threatening as possible in public spaces or risk being shot. Only they know, for example, that to go out in a hoodie while cold might literally mean a death sentence. We think that violence therefore is an incredible avenue of empowerment for these minority communities. Why? Because we think violent confrontation is fundamentally about a clash of indomitable wills. Neither are willing to give in, neither are willing to give up. Winning that confrontation panel is empowering to the extreme because it is a belief, even for a split second, that your problems can be solved by tapping your oppressors by two in the back of the head. Uh, two in the back is the last avenue of empowerment often available to be in African Americans, individuals within the status quo. Why then do you want to take this particular avenue of empowerment away from them? And they can't claim that, look, we are really, uh, uh, on the comparative panel, here's what happens. Non-violent confrontation necessarily demands that these community members go back on their values. Why? And, like, probably because they're not hard. Because A, to claim that the degree of oppression that they are facing now is not worthy of their violent outburst is principally a disingenuous concession. But two, we think that submission to the narrative in the status quo that things are still okay, a narrative Push for, for example, by the white community within America that less confrontation uh, that will cause less confrontation is bad because this means that even your white communities acknowledge that look, even your own songs sit down, acknowledge uh, think that the situation in the status quo is still okay. We don't think at all in any way that is the outcome that we want to solve it. But lastly, we think that these songs are also often a call to arms or call to arms. It is an increased popularity of the songs means that more African Americans are motivated to protest. Black Lives Matter, for example, plays changes by two pet before their marches. It increases participation, which we think is fundamentally good. Why? Because increased participation simply means more political capital, because politicians start to pay attention. It is no coincidence, for example, it is only after the Black Lives Matter movement that was created that we are only now talking about police shooting, uh, like uh, the, uh, disproportionate use of force by police individuals upon the African American community. We think the comparative on their side is the usage of non-violent messages fundamentally a creates 
<coughs> less impetus for the African American communities themselves to come forward to these particular marches. We think that the less participation, conversely, uh, means that's true, right? Less attention, less political, uh, less political attention to create change. But lastly, we acknowledge. Right? Let's say they, uh, in the very worst case that they can characterize their harm. More and more people think the African American community uh, like, are violent. So what's the problem, panel? We think that their current state of existence is only one that's increased, increasingly disgusting. Panel, we think that too often we do not realize the visceral harm that it is to uh, that exists that it is to exist as black in America, for example. Sure, we agree that more violence and more confrontation will occur. We are perfectly okay with that. Because the stance of opposition is that there is a principal rationale for you to rebel. It is not wrong, for example, for you to rebel against a state that chains and shackles you to economic poverty for all those reasons we are proud to oppose. <laughs> Panel, sorry, sorry, I was doing this. Panel adjudicators, in my speech, what I'm going to talk to you about is I'm going to compare the African American ethnic group in America to other successful ethnic groups in America and why, fundamentally, because the African Americans have been robbed of their own cultures or their own self defining cultures, that they have been systematically disenfranchised compared to other ethnic groups such as Jewish Americans, Mormons, Cuban Americans, some of the highest earning. Uh, minorities in America, how they have been able to formulate their own cultures and how they've done better than African Americans and why we think this policy and open government is going to change that as well. I'm going to talk to you about three things in my speech. First, I'm going to bring back this idea about youth entrapment that Ali talked about that was somewhat engaged with from leader of opposition, rather abhorrently, because I think literally the leader of opposition supported young black Americans going onto the streets and putting their lives yeah. at risk, ladies and gentlemen. Secondly, I want to talk to you about reclaiming the African American identity. Thirdly, I want to talk to you about white paranoia and why that becomes worse in your side. Lastly, I want to talk about political traction and which side best does this. Before that, a few points of rebuttals. Three, in fact. First, they told us that white people are ignorant and they're unaware of the issues which face and plague the African American community. These songs help bring those things up. I think Ali made it really clear that on our side of the house, we're not stopping artists, or we still support artists talking about the issues that they face. For example, police brutality, for example, uh, problems getting employment, or housing, or college scholarships, for example. And we think some artists still do do this. Beyonce does this in the song Lemonade. She doesn't tell people to go on the street and like actively fight cops. She literally tells them to, for example, stand up for your rights, you know, at the same time respecting and loving other human beings, ladies and gentlemen. We think Frank Ocean still does this when he talks about, for example, how it's very hard to live in like underprivileged communities, but they don't actively advocate for violence. So we think we still get awareness on our side. But we really think that the, 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 the concept of the a retaliation that the white community has had is that before the 70s, if you notice, a lot of the anti-black anti sentiment in America was far formulated around white supremacy, i.e. during uh, like the civil rights movement, a lot of states refused, especially the southern states, the bio Belt states, refused to like uh, desegregate their schools, for example. So there was a lot of white supremacy. That was the dominant narrative. After the 70s, after the rise of hip hop, after the, the, the riots that we saw in Southside Chicago and in the Bronx and Harlem, for example, when these when black hip hop was resonating within these communities who were also like actively rioting against police, that narrative changes from one of white supremacy to that of black people are criminals and they're dangerous. So it's, we would say that it's actively hip hop which has, which has changed the way in which African Americans are being discriminated, one from just being like white people are better, uh, into that of which African Americans are criminals. Secondly, they told us issues need to be addressed. We told you that's not mutually exclusive. Lastly, they told you that violence is actually a last value of empowerment. We would say, A, to an extent, we would still kind of support this. We would say that you know, artists should still like talk about self-defense. Obviously, Beyonce shouldn't say like, oh, if a cop is going to shoot you, just stand there, you know, and do nothing. Obviously, like we can still advocate for things like self-defense and self-protection, but we think this is a horrible narrative to tell young uh, African Americans. This is my first issue about youth empowerment. Ali told you that what happens is when you have, especially in underprivileged, poorer African American communities, these musical icons become like, you know, gospel truth. Yeah. And they formulate cultures around these videos. So what that means is, even within an African American neighborhood, 
black males and youths will tell each other, hey, why are you going to school? It's not cool. Why don't you have a gun? You should. Why aren't you helping me deal drugs? Why aren't you, you know, for example, doing all this other stuff? Because they necessarily resonate with the cultures that two parts, the NW, that the Bloods and the Crips set out for them, ladies and gentlemen. That's harmful. Because what this means is an African American youth who wants to like actively like study hard or like wants to like rid himself of this and like try to assimilate into culture because that's their choice. And if that's how they better themselves, then they should have the choice to do that. But they can't because they trapped in these cultures that these musical icons, who by the way, got shot dead, most of them, a long time ago, are not necessarily perpetuating. We think it's harmful to tell young young African-American males and females to put their lives on the line just to advocate for some sort of change in the community. Oftentimes, this is going to target underprivileged communities. Obviously, rich artists like Childish Gambino isn't going to like, or like, like, like his, okay, elite African-American families aren't going to like be affected by this, but it's usually the underprivileged. So you are actively saying that underprivileged people should put their lives on the streets, put their lives on the line in order to advocate for change. Second, I want to talk about reclaiming African-American identity. Now, I read a book, it was really interesting. It talked about how ethnic groups who succeed in a multicultural country like America oftentimes do this because they have strong cultural foundations. Cuban Americans, for example, one of the highest earning uh, families in America, have this, this culture that they ran away from Cuba during the Cuban Revolution, that they re literally built Miami and have assimilated into American culture. Mormons believe that Jesus visited America and that the Garden of Eden is in Jackson City, Missouri. Jews believe they are the chosen people and that America is the place <coughs> where they will finally, you know, like uh, assimilate into modern culture. Asian Americans have their culture, you know, their discipline. You know, their, their cultures of discipline, of, of selfhood. Uh, that's why you see a lot of Asian American families putting a lot of stress on academ uh, academic qualifications and academic achievements. However, African Americans had their cultures stolen from them when they were actively enslaved by white Americans. White Americans took away the ability for African Americans to create their own cultures. And the only culture that they did create was one which retrospect, like, was one retaliating towards the white entrapment, ladies and gentlemen. We would say that African American artists today have a higher moral duty to reclaim that culture because they are able to. People like Charles Gambino, people like Frank Ocean, people like um, Beyonce, yes, we would argue, yes, they do come from you know, a, a slightly more privileged African American backgrounds, but because they got there, because they beat the system, they should tell other people how they could beat the system too, not tell people to actually put their lives on the line just to get some sort of traction. No. So there's a bit of a tension here in your case. So how are you going to reclaim uh, black culture and identity if you're still going to talk about all the poverty and violence and still want to talk about that, but just a peaceful manner? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's fair to say that problems still exist. So I think it's fair for Beyonce to say that black people are still targeted by police, that a lot of African American neighborhoods don't get good housing, don't get welfare. But at the same time, it is the manner in which we should uh, like fight or advocate for this change. So we're not saying what issues should be talking about, we're talking about the manner in which we should advocate. Last year, this thing about white paranoia, we told you white people are likely to retaliate and they have been retaliating. They told you, no, this will raise awareness. What's more likely to happen? Do you think that a white individual who owns a corporation or who's a head of the college like admissions committee, hearing this sort of music, are they going to feel more aware and understanding of African-American issues? Or are they likely to say, I do not want to admit or employ an African-American individual because this is the culture I think they subscribe to. Last thing about political traction, we would say that violence and uh, Violence to try and gain political traction has failed. That's what we saw during the civil rights movement. It was people like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King who got a lot of traction rather than the Black Panther movement who scared a lot of allies of the African American community. We would say today that we need to change the way in which we approach the issue because obviously violence and confrontation hasn't worked. We have to seem accessible to our allies. We have to seem like individuals who can play on equal ground within the system. Of course, we're going to fix the system, but it's how we fix the system, and it starts by fixing hip hop. Thank you. Thank you. existence and lived experiences of African Americans is not just worthy of music like what government wanted to tell you about, but it's also worthy of anger. Denying the oppressed community the ability to 
feel or actualize certain emotions like anguish, anger, sadness, bitterness is what happens under their parenting. And I'm going to explain why music is a source of escapism, especially for oppressed communities and therefore whitewashing hip hop like to serve uh, the agenda of the majority. It's just something unthinkable, right? Let's look at what they, their only like uh, point was, right? We should not, like basically, um, hip hop traps black communities with ne negative associations. First, we should not alter the direction of music lest we anger or upset the white men, right? Because first of all, they were never the main stakeholders in this debate itself. Hip hop artists should be, shouldn't be held ransom to what majority white people think. It, they should be thinking about who their target audience are. And we think that most listeners of hip hop are members of the black community because hip hop is not exactly mainstream. Mainstream hip hop looks like Iggy Azalea, it looks like your metal more, right? Does not look like your, your actual like uh, black hip hop in, in the first place. And we think that white people have many reasons to retain the negative perception of like your white uh, of your black communities, regardless, right? This racist reporting in the media that often show black people as criminals rather than white people as criminals. No interaction because of the <coughs> communities and the ghettoization of your black communities. Offensive portrayal of black communities within the media. And if they want to go like to the extent of like you know making sure that all these negative stereotypes are like distanced from the black community, we don't think that hip hop is the place that you should start or even robbing people like the black community of the only avenue where they can escape this hostile like hostile world is the only like is something that we don't agree with. So okay. we think that they don't uh, allow the underprivileged that they want to talk about to even access the benefits of hip hop. I'm going to explain the benefits of hip hop as like, a, like to the community, and this will like cover most of the other rebuttals I have to Rafik's case. Right, the first thing I want to talk about is escapism through music. <laughs> the same way violent movies sometimes ex like depict an imagery of violence that can give catharsis and relief to some viewers because of the nature of that violence. Like think about Gone Girl and how much like catharsis it gave to women who were like victims of emotional abuse or like, mental abuse in the first place. Right, hip hop and black culture is how for few hours in a day, like a person of black like of black origin can escape the hostile world that they live in. Like for the fact the fact is that you get catharsis from even imagining or like saying the words fuck the police, right? Because if you have been like stopped and frisked or if you have like been held at gunpoint of you, if you have lost a member of your own community to the police shooting, this is the only way you can actually actualize your anger. That, that's true protest, that's true even escapism. So we're not even taking the burden of like making sure everyone goes out on the streets to protest. We think that even like in your private space, this gives you the ability to have some form of catharsis, to have some form of like self-reflection with the, the struggles of not only yourself but your communities. And we think that that's where music represents your lived experiences and your struggles. And that's why it's so important for you to even like to, to forming your identity and also shaping your identity. Hip hop in particular has been like that, right? And this is where I go to the second idea. How hip hop has been a reflection of community struggles. If Rafi wanted to tell you that, you know, you like uh, the problem is that people are losing track, like track of their own cultures. We think that hip hop, like what government does, is actually force us forcefully assimilate the culture in the first place, right? <coughs> Music and the celebration of their culture through dance was what got the black community through slavery, Jim Crow, police brutality. Even until now, you still see elements of your African origins in within these hip hop cultures, within the dancers, within rap music as well. And we think that they don't have like dance offs on the streets because it's the only source of happiness they get in an oppressive system that constantly targets them. Which is why when you, what they are proposing is essentially whitewashing of hip hop or any other form of African American culture or tradition born out of rebellion. The essence of hip hop was rebellion and they are going to strip away the very rebellion that existed within hip hop itself. We don't think that you preserve American African American culture, you erode it constantly. We think that that's something that's problematic. Closing. Hip-hop doesn't have a definitive culture. Rap literally just means rhythm and poetry. <coughs> Cultures evolve and people learn to express and feel in different ways. Of course it has evolved to like fit the white like mainstream narratives, right? That's why rap in initially was out of protest to uh, uh, like all the struggles that the black communities faced in the first place. The fact that it was like culturally appropriated by white artists and then made to be a lot more moderate than it's supposed to be does not mean that that's the value that we hold dear to the black community in the first place. So that's what I'm talking to you about, right? Providing the same meaning and experience 
to them why the lyrics is important. And when music no longer gives them the same satisfaction or the sanctuary or the like ability to reflect on or even view the world in the same way or the happenings of the black community you live in, right. you lose the essence of hip hop and you lose the very audience that you're supposed to cater to. Because now, like the person on the ground who's not gonna be like, I should be like uh learning self-defense to deal with the police because that's not how I feel about the police in the first place. I feel anger towards the police and the fact that my community and the music that it like, does not represent that value means that I've lost that sense of touch with that, like, the, that tradition itself and we think that that's where you kill black communities and the, like, the, and the music that they are supposed to hold dear to them. But lastly, let's look at the narrative impact because the narrative impact that this, this uh, sort of the governments will have has is one that is inherently disempowering, even if it may be well-meaning, right? Realize that music has real consequences on how we deal with issues and whether we even treat certain things as issues in the first place. Like for example, if you have lyrics that promote or sorry, ly lyrics can promote or empowering or disempowering narratives. For example, when bloodlines was extremely was extremely controversial because it trivialized rape. And even though it, it may not have like made people go out and rape, the fact is they contributed to a culture of ignorance and that is the same thing that's going to happen under their side. Let's just listen to the kind of lyrics that Ali was talking about. It seems like the black people have to walk on eggshells to even like <coughs> exist in the community when they should be actually openly talking about and reflecting their sentiments and their lived experiences. That's why we think ultimately what the narrative impact they bring is the free obedience and submission to a clearly oppressive system. And we think that that's something that does not happen in like a true court, like true true conception of hip-hop itself. If we think that hip-hop is supposed to be rebellion, even if it's for private catharsis, we think we achieve it better when hip-hop artists are not censored, like censoring themselves for, or they're censoring their actual thoughts and emotions for the betterment of a community that's not going to be empowered under their side. For all these reasons, very proud to be proposed. <laughs> Members of the floor. The great Kanye West once said, fuck the police, that's how I treat them. We buy our way out of jail, but we can't buy freedom. As catchy as those lyrics were, it never truly helped us in the cause of forwarding what African Americans truly deserve, and it further antagonized the majority to be disgusted by the violent culture celebrated by the blacks to the extent that even top artists believe that it is an okay message for you to tell to your society, even when people who are listening to your music includes underage individuals. We believe that it's time to change and emphasize on change through realistic means that can actually bring negotiations for you to further get your rights through policies, and that can only happen through peaceful means. Two questions in my speech. Number one, why songs about violence perpetuates further negative stereotypes of African Americans, extending what OG talked about, but more importantly, why peaceful lyrics are more strategic to forward the cause of the African Americans. And just to be clear, what exactly are we then okay with, or what do these peaceful lyrics then look like? Because I don't think that the moment you're not allowed to say, kill that ignorant white man, that it suddenly means that you are unable to come up with other ways of expressing your disagreement with the way your community is being treated. We want songs that say, like, don't be violent, the best revenge is your paper, to continuously agree that working hard and not giving up on education, that there is a means for you to be able to fight for your right to education and not always through violence. Songs addressing, uh, addressing irony with lyrics like, oh, you and I, we're black and white, we're no different, we're just separated by education, a gun, a bat, a shield and a right. I think that these are the sarcasm and the irony that a lot of individuals who come from this hip-hop industry are capable of doing, considering the fact that they are master of words and I don't think that they suddenly would be incapable of spreading that message. First question, why songs about violence perpetuates the negative stereotypes of African Americans? Because currently, we think that stereotypes become far worse in your world. It's not just about people believing that 
violence is a norm of a culture for the African American community, as what OG said. But we think that you further entrench it, the point at which you say it's okay for artists to make this their dominant rhetoric when it comes to releasing songs. Why? Because it further makes the uh, majority of individuals believe that violence is so entrenched within the culture and the norm of the African Americans that even when you are rich, that even when you are exposed to opportunity <coughs> and you have a lot of networking, you still believe in violence. That's what it says. That it's not just talking about the African Americans who are poor, but even those who are rich still believe in this violence, and that's something that's bad. What we had for um, opening opposition was that, but it's good, right? We don't think that it's really that stereotypical because we're taking ownership over the song because it's a form of escape prison. I think that number one, we have to acknowledge that your rhetoric, considering the fact that this violent, uh, these violent lyrics become the dominant rhetoric within your music, it means that you trap other people to become slaves towards your message. Because not every African American out there wants to be violent and to assume otherwise is racist, right? We think that not everybody believes in your form of messaging, but because you're an artist, because this is the dominant lyrics that you perpetuate, people outside believe that that is your culture. That means your escapism of freedom of expression can take a back seat towards how your message actually tracks other people who cannot opt out of the message that you are perpetuating. No. But secondly, I think that your experiences and your ability to self-actualize through your music is still possible even if you don't say, fuck the police. So I think there needs to be a lot more nuance coming from that side of the house. Second question, and more importantly, why peaceful lyrics are strategic to forward their cause? Number one is because we believe that it's less confrontational, right? Because you're actually learning the language that makes negotiation more possible. You're saying that we have to walk up, like on eggshells and be very careful. I don't think that you have to be careful in terms of the cause. You can be very blunt about what you are not okay with. But I think removing violent messages in vacuum of saying you can shoot an ignorant man or you can say fuck the white privilege and the white <coughs> individuals that exist within the community to the extent where we should go out and harm them is not something that is actually very good. It becomes more confrontational, right? We think that if these rappers are masters of words, they probably can still forward these causes without being as uh, unnecessarily confrontational, right? They can still have that message, no. They can still spread that urgency. The fact that music, a lot of the time, is coupled with video clips to further elaborate or illustrate the sort of messages that you're trying to talk about. During interviews, when singles are released and when albums are released, these artists get questioned by the media. What was the message that you were trying to perpetuate through your album? Or what about this song? What was the message that you had? That gave the opportunity for also these hip-hop artists to say a lot of what they wanted to say without being pursued violent first. The problem why this can't exist in your world, no, is because people already have a presumption of violence before they even get to ask that question. That means that when they ask you that question and when you answer, they're perceiving your answer to a veil of biasness of assuming that you're violent because of your initial thoughts. No, we want things to be less confrontational. It's good because it means that people on the other side are more likely to listen. They feel more sympathetic towards you. They feel that there is goodwill on your side to want to that despite how horrible your community is being treated right now, that you are still capable of um, being reasonable and diplomatic in the way you achieve those rights. But secondly, we think that you also, no thank you, we make it easier for sympathetic white people to convince other white people because the races now have less of an ability to confirm their biases in telling those sympathetic white people, why should you be sorry for them? Did you not see their lyrics? Did you not see what Kanye and Tupac say? And these are the most privileged of people in that group. Why should you back them up? What happens in your world? Hold on. It means that people are less willing to listen. The stereotype gets engraved in their minds. People are pushed towards becoming more defensive, right? Like if somebody is confrontational to you, I highly doubt the white people are going to be like, oh, okay, let me listen to you. They're going to start rationalizing the sort of radical thoughts that they have. So I'm one closing. So, confrontation isn't only about call for violence and things like that. So you also have to have a support, not support lyrics that are directly blaming things like the police or the very, very anti establishment lyrics. Alright, thank you. There is a different, there's a spectrum of confrontation, right? It's, there's a difference between me telling you, don't treat me this way because it has not helped my community in getting education for centuries, as opposed to Fuck you, you have no idea what I've been going through. You probably deserve to be shot the next time you take education away from you. I think there is a different in reactions that exist from people on the ground. So we think that in our world, it's more reasonable how people end up getting that negotiation. We are unclear above and beyond people saying, fuck the police, Black Lives Matter, going with riots up on the street, how that translates into actual policy making or the will of the majority to want to come in and agree with you. But lastly, we think that um, 
like in a world where the dominant rhetoric is uh, violence, you discredit current efforts of people who are trying to be moderate, right? Because by association, people will say, people outside will say, why should I listen to you? Because if the majority of the people act in a violent manner, how do I know that you're just not angry enough, that you probably will be violent soon enough? The reason why all of this is important is because so long as you don't create some will and some strategic means to get the other side to negotiate, that's how long more you will probably get screwed within our society and that's something you can't stand for. Thank you. Problems and a large chunk of that is government bench. Because we were going to test from both in opposition that hip hop isn't just about rap and violence, it is also a way of life, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, we would like to know the running away from this debate that the entirety of government seems to want to operate because the emotion doesn't just require you to argue, let's remove violence. They have to defend the world when they can't argue any confrontational ideals, ladies and gentlemen, even conceding in that confrontation can come in many different ways. We think that what you don't always have to say fuck the police, but individuals should be allowed to call individuals out for police brutality, ladies and gentlemen. And non-confrontation means we'll never be able to do that because there is a stark difference between the white man took away your rights versus hmm, perhaps our rights were taken away. Which one inspires a call to action and validates the individual's rights to be able to call for social justices? We think that closing our position will be the team that will be able to do that. One, we will talk about why there is a need to inject a sense of realism via the hip hop industry in order to elucidate the sort of structural oppression that individuals currently face in status quo. Uh, in, all my end will be integrated, let's bulldoze those again. One, let's talk about the hip hop industry. We think that uh, often the hip hop industry is born from the structural and social oppression that they have faced from the time that they were brought into America until today. So, contrary to open government, it didn't define them, they define music to elucidate what their lives were like, ladies and gentlemen. So, you have things like cycle of poverty, police brutality, racial profiling, as well as myriad of active and inclusive discrimination in education, justice, and economy. And it's unique to these communities, unlike what open government believes, and you can't compare them to the Jews in the United States of America because the Jews don't face the current kinds of discrimination that. After Americans face in that country. What we must acknowledge is that the reality of status quo is that the vast majority of African American identity tends to overlap. And we think that it's important that some sense of realism must be depicted in this debate. Some give you an emphasis and obligation to realistically depict that to call individuals out. Secondly, hip hop is uniquely important in that it becomes one of the primary ways in which people build identities for people to coalesce behind issues. That's why qualitatively, how the speech of people in mainstream music is often based on the yardstick of how does your pitch sound or how good your voice is, but in hip hop, there's no judgment and it only matters insofar as you can spit rhymes that mean something, ladies and gentlemen. So why is there an obligation to maintain realism or sit down? One is that there is a shared common experiences from these artists and individuals that are currently oppressed in status quo. But what's uniquely different is that you are a group of individuals that were able to escape the oppression and to build an identity that's independent from your oppression to begin with, ladies and gentlemen. You are the current visible identifiers in status quo and often you are perceived as success stories. But we think that being able to break out of it means that you have an obligation, even if it's hard work, even if it could be unpopular, for you to depict the sort of stories that your brothers currently face. What are the impacts of these songs, ladies and gentlemen? One, Often the politics of race in the US isn't black and white to begin with. You have some criticism, but let's look at the extent and quality of that criticism. What it happens sporadically, triggered by very egregious forms of violence, and often requires, like, uh, certainly often the nuance of those criticism is often missed. One, the reason is because it's very hard for other communities to relate to that oppression. Two, because the majority don't go through the same fear that the African American community currently face. So, why paranoia? This could be an issue in this debate, but it must be comparative to the entire lives of African American communities built up on paranoia from white individuals. Secondly, we argue that often your narrative not becomes captured at the point which you don't confront ideals. So, when we brought up Black Lives Matter, people often uh, social justice warriors that went on a rant about all lives matter, blue lives matter, and misses the nuance of the substantive discussion in how we then acknowledge music. No, thank you. Why is music specifically important? One, we would say that music is a 
approachable in that people are able to adapt to music unlike any other language in status quo. So that's why white communities were initially attracted to the hip hop industry because of, that, because of the beats that they started with. That's why hip hop became wildly popular, but they then moved on to internalizing the lyrics and the sentiment behind those lyrics because it's different than any other type of music, right? We don't think the larger majority of mainstream music often talks about things like love and heartbreak and what is essentially unique to hip hop industry is that it discusses primarily oppression. Sit down guys and correct me this bit. What are the impacts? One is that when it comes to hip hop music is that there's subliminal messaging that inculcates within individuals' mind. Perhaps there is a reason why a group of community always talks about the same confrontational issues and always talk about the same kind of oppression because and acknowledging the fact that the music is highly raw and passionate and unscripted in nature, we think that is an important value. Closing up, we well, let's have sarcasm in mass language because that's easy. We think one of the way which people engage with sarcasm in mass language is that often it's treated as a double the thunder or a euphemism, ladies and gentlemen. And we can just flippantly engage and see if perhaps there's no substantive quality behind the argumentation because, well, perhaps the language could be interpreted differently, but what's great about hip hop is direct in nature. It's confrontational because it doesn't hide behind language of you euphemism or doesn't hide behind like sensibilities and political correctness, ladies and gentlemen. What does this policy do? One, we think it implicates the realities of oppression in that it dilutes the degree of harm in that perhaps we can solve racial dynamics by accepting things like tolerance and love. Perhaps that is the final solution in which we engage with. What does it do? One, it builds a warp form of conclusion in that you can solve all of your oppression and your right racial dynamics by being nice. Two, that people who have strong beliefs will change in the how they treat beliefs and judgment. So we think what it does is that it inculcates a different form of tolerance in that like you tell African American communities you are supposed to just use tolerance as a form of acceptance. If you just tolerate each other, it's enough to placate all of your issues in status quo, ladies and gentlemen, as opposed to acknowledging racism, people don't even stop to consider whether they are currently oppressed to begin with, right? All those impressions of people that OG talk about are impacted as well. Go, OG. Okay, uh, blues and jazz musicians like B.B. King and Billy Holiday were able to talk about poverty and sexism in the African American community. It was also uh, along with the rise of the civil rights movement. Okay. It got a lot of white allies. Do you think that's a better alternative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, why do we don't think this is just about white allies, but also allowing for people within the African American communities having a banner in which they can coalesce, right? Jazz music isn't as wildly popular as hip hop as it is in status quo before, because it pervades in every other aspect of your life, ladies and gentlemen. As opposed to, so lastly, let's talk about discussion. We think that discussion becomes limited and substantive because often when you ask for your rights, you are told to check your privilege because past the point of tolerance and acceptance, there's nothing more you can ask for, ladies and gentlemen. We think this impacts political conversations in that people who are currently oppressed feel less entitled to their anger and their outrage and it dilutes their ability to claim power in the sense of oppression that they currently face and how they materialize and express that oppression. It impacts social movements and they strengthen that message at the point in which you say that the way in which you deal with racial dynamics is to merely apply moral values like tolerance and acceptance and that will deal with the decades upon decades of oppression that this community is currently face, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's insufficient, especially in a world where racial politics <coughs> targeting African Americans have not moved on. We don't think that government can run away from this debate and mask it behind euphemism very proud to propose. <laughs> In order to talk about peace, you have to say why you want peace, and that includes highlighting the problems with war. That means this debate was never about us not, i.e., confronting the issue. The word non confrontational literally is about the strategy through which you identify and deal with those issues, right? That is why we saw it during the roll call was Black Eyed Peas, like, what about the song one, right? <laughs> Two things that I'll talk about. 
first some principal starts of why why do we think that we are the ones who are playing true to rap and second what works first on a principal starts because i feel that opposition's kind of line like insinuating that violence the form of rap is <coughs> quite problematic for a, a few reasons number one i think that's an assumption of what they think rap should be and that has been determined by modern contemporary rappers and not necessarily what rap ought to be but also that flies in the contradiction of so many rappers who don't form into the stereotype the closing opposition would like them to form into you know beyonce bb king Nicki minaj whatever right third like in terms of this right so i think but also if you notice all of the arguments for opening opposition closing opposition are talking about why violence is an inherent part of empowerment at best case scenario that is an argument to say that these lyrics should include forms of violence but at no point do they give reasons as to why we should not include lyrics about peace and i think those are fundamentally different things to talk about in this debate so they so they can talk about like violent uh, like you know rap reaching out to a particular community but why can't rap be said about the state of affairs and why can't that be a form of expression and a way in which people identify with it in modern society so that's something that was their burden that they never ever took up they never actually talked about the bloody motion and that's my problem with this right so on a on a balance i would say that we are the ones catering to more people and respecting that rap can be diverse if anything and that's what we do as a result of our policy but especially ladies and gentlemen we don't think rap should be concentrated and controlled by one pair a pair or a few amount of contemporary rappers right no thank you actually i'll take over now okay imagery is as important as a metaphor to show the depth of pain in your life, in your existence and imagery will be the vehicle for encouraging resistance and resilience if you prioritize this imagery to all other imageries even for the catharsis of the person why not i'm not sure what that meant um i think imagery in terms of like trying to get people to move i think they're pretty moving songs that black people can do that are not confrontational right so i'll i'll deal with that right so what works i'll answer this in a more holistic level what works i think a few things i think closing opposition the closers they come to talk about it is like oh we need to inspire call to action i think there are enough reasons to motivate people who are discriminated to be called to action right that's not the biggest priority in this debate the more the more important thing is how do you reach out so i'll preempt this right i i assume opening opposition kind of wanted to hint that you can't create like traction in terms of like highlighting of issues in fact you can we have had these songs that have highlighted these issues but beyond that non confrontational approaches calling capernet going ahead and sitting down during national anthem non violent approaches that can be controversial that can be called that can that can be like you know highlighted right oscars like oscar so white hashtag these are non confrontational things that did it like the now this like video of the hugger who went around the black person who went around hugging police officers in the middle of a protest these are non confrontational approaches which you can get attention in the sort of ways and like black lives matter the initial days it was a peaceful protest in ferguson that's how the initial attention came to begin with right so we think all of these kinds of non confrontational approaches can actually get you the attention that you want the image you argument doesn't really happen there but in fact what happens ladies and gentlemen is in fact we think that a couple of things happens number one we told you on a psychological level why people are less likely to be able to react and you can't run away from this debate you need the buy in of the majority right and by the way these rappers inspire and are able to create social movements that come from within these communities so like fuck the police is a movement created by a, by rappers right so you can't just run away from the fact that these people create the way social movements can occur so given that exists what approach works best right so i think First of all we told you why these people can grab attention but in fact there are two responses number one when people are confrontational rather than non confrontational people want to find ways to rationalize their discrimination because the initial standpoint they're coming from is one that says that one that, that has cognitive dissonance and does not want to listen to your concerns because the initial idea is of dislike of you that means they will find reasons to kind of like not take into account your considerations your arguments that means you start off in a hostile playing field that does not play into the psychology of the people you want to change the minds of but secondly no thank you and i think this is perhaps a bit more uh, that the second most important thing is this the people who can create changes the moderates in the middle get shunned out by two both both groups one 
from internal groups because apparently, like CEO would do, they are not part of the black culture anymore because black culture has been defined by a set of hip hop artists. This means the kinds of people yeah. who would get actual change, the moderates, the people who <coughs> would have more competition approaches, get drowned out and in fact told that that's not the way we ask for our rights. And that becomes disempowering for them, but also removes any ability for traction to happen within that community. But the second reason why this happens is when they want to reach out to the majority, the majority culture also looks at them and brushes them with the same wavelength of the, of the violent movement. This means you're coming from the same movement that is not deemed legitimate to begin with. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, the moderates can't really have the same kinds of traction that we would like them to have. And in fact, if anything, this continuous form of violence and messaging has become boring. If anything, their continuous spreading of messaging has become so such a constant that it no longer draws attention. That it is no longer a new thing for a rapper to say violent things in a, for the rights of black people. This is why the Black Lives Matter, when it turned more violent, big had reactions of all lives matter. Because people are just sick and tired of you trying to like, you know, uh, trying try, try to do the same thing over and over again. It's become part of the plan. They just ridicule you with these kinds of things rather than responding to you in kind. The way to make them engage in constructive levels is to first not let them want to, you know, be in opposition to you right from the get-go. That's how human psychology works. That's how social movements can work. problem with government is that they try to achieve things like Biden. They try to disassociate African Americans from uh, notions of violence and things like that. We don't actually analyzing whether or not the distance was meaningful or whether or not the buy-in from uh, the white majority was actually meaningful on their side. What does this mean? This means that if the buy-in on their side are not confrontational in nature, it means you don't force them to actually accept the death of their fault and then the point or the magnitude of anger from the African American community. Why is this so important? Because Jean already told you, right? All these things we mean to us unless they're fully confronted with the many different narratives that exist. We told you that non-confrontational messages non-confrontational messages also mean that they cannot be doing things like directly blaming white allies for the reason of their oppression. That's how they get all the white buy-in on their side, so they claim. Or things like, you cannot do all those things like blame directly the police for all the brutalities that happen on their side as well. Because all this anti-police and anti-white people sentiment will as well turn away all the white allies as they wanted to claim. So this means that all the white allies buy in on their side are less meaningful because they will acknowledge that's right there's some targeting of african americans but not acknowledge the depth of racism and the hatefulness that exists which actually deals with the real anger of african americans so we see the integration and the conversation isn't effective on that side we are very happy for hip-hop to always be a raw social criticism of the worst oppression that happens from African Americans. We think it should be able to remain raw because it's a true representative of how people feel about the way in which those things happen. Shutting out their real outrage means that you shut out the real legitimate outrage and feelings that they have. Why is this important? Because Jay told you that on our side, we actually create true empowerment and legitimacy of the pursuit of African American rights. Realize that this is a community who have been oppressed, neglected, and felt disentitled for many rights for many years. These are also some of the poorest of the communities. So in order for you to ensure that they feel a lot more enlightened and 
They're a lot more empowered with their rights or feel like they're entitled, they're entitled to the anger that they have means that you need to allow for a lot of stronger message on their side as well. So it means that messages like fuck the white person, it was always their fault, allows them to internalize the fact that the reason why they're in cyclical poverty wasn't their fault and wasn't because they were lazy, but largely because of the oppression of the white majority to begin with. Only strong messages like this will appeal towards their anger and uplift them and truly empower them. Why is this important? Because we equally need African Americans to feel entitled to their rights for them to pursue their rights as well. On their side, they, they never tell us the appeal of their very, very sarcastic lyrics or the appeal of their really, really sad lyrics. Because those sad lyrics don't empower individuals, only make you come into terms with the oppression that you have and make you realize, okay, I am oppressed. But don't empower the same feeling of outrage that channels you towards changes and policy changes that we want on our side. Only we create those necessary discourse and necessary necessary messages to empower the birth of social movements. Like they assume that social movements come out of nowhere and come mm. up. The reason why they came out was just very, very happy. Suddenly they feel one day that they need a social movement. All of them come from genuine outreach that people have that we think are only created through the empowerment of the community through channeling their route through outreach. We think that's the only way we do that. So thank you. But what form of integration do you create on their side? So messages like very, very peaceful, non-confrontational messages, like for example, maybe love everyone or things like that. We think that those messages will not be very, very strategic in the way in which integration happens. Because we must realize that African Americans were already at a disadvantage when it comes to the integration that happens. Which means that the integration that you can expect on their side is a lot more tolerant of the African Americans being a lot more tolerant of the racism that happened rather than them being empowered to call out all of those racism because they don't feel entitled to their outrage and anger. So we think that integration that happens on their side will be a facade of integration mm -hmm. in which most of those people that are just tolerant and this means that African Americans will get the shorter end of the stick when it comes to their integration. Jay told you this when she told you that political correctness doesn't create the form of integration that we want. Go ahead. Okay, so we are not going to ask black artists to deny racism. And we understand that people need an outlet to vent and to feel outrage. But don't you think, Jasmine, it's dangerous when this outrage becomes a culture and an expectation which traps individuals into acting that way? No. So what do we think happens on our side? We think only that outrage is the only ability for them to feel empowered in order to fight for all of their rights. Because they weren't able to prove to us, absent of that outrage, that people will go to the streets, that people will actually feel empowered to fight for their rights. You can have every other people being located and feeling that they don't have to confront of their rights and they don't are not entitled to fight the white majority. We don't think they will. Then you need to prove us the counterfactual as well. But secondly, we also think that it's important to note what OG had in this debate, right? So OG first had a very, very uh, conflicting case in which they want to redefine the way in which culture works by disengaging people from violence, but later on that second speaker suddenly want to embrace that violence and still talk about it as well. We don't think that they're able to disassociate violence from African Americans, right? One, we think those associated with violence didn't come from hip hop, rather it comes from the unfortunate fact that African Americans occupy a large statistic in the crime rate. But uniquely, hip hop culture criticizes that in the most raw manner that tells you that it wasn't their fault. All those lyrics like fuck the, the government or things like that create a strong message to show that they weren't responsible for the high crime rates or they weren't responsible for the positions that they are in today that truly creates actual sympathy for their cause as well. We need society to realize that they don't deserve to be in this position and we think other than a strong message you won't be able to convince anyone that they deserve anything more than what they have right now so any buy <coughs> that you have wouldn't be effective if people don't believe in that uh, in what happens there right so we told you very exclusively from jay's speech the unique role in which hip-hop had in societal criticism and why it's really important in upholding social justice and in order to ensure that social movements are able to be more legitimized in the manner in which they confront those issues. We think it's better if we have people empowering the whole way in which social movement works and the very, very fair way in which social movements channel their outrage and anger that people legitimately feel they're proud to oppose. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, bro. Thanks for
Tadi yang menyuruh, tadi yang menyuruh Asking about white privilege, I want to make a joke Ah, look at that, white man Asking about white privilege Oh yeah, what? Sorry, white privilege 